Hello and welcome. As the war in Ukraine rages on, it's time for a weekly analysis of the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. As usual, I welcome political scientist Gerhard Mangot from the University of Innsbruck. Good morning. Good morning. And my dear colleague Alexander Stipsitz, uh, residing in the Czech Republic. Good morning. Good morning. So maybe this time let's begin with something hopeful. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Zelensky uh, said in several interviews that the NATO membership is not mandatory for Ukraine anymore. Uh, does this open room for negotiations or is this far too less for Vladimir Putin? Well, uh, Zelensky argued that uh, NATO membership is no longer something that he is very keen on. He spoke about uh, himself cooling down on the prospect of Ukraine joining NATO because uh, NATO has demonstrated over the past years that it's not willing to accept Ukraine as a member. And he argued that uh, we will not beg for membership on our knees. Uh, that's not something that the state of Ukraine uh, is willing to do. And he said, I'm ready to discuss uh, the future of uh, Crimea and the republics in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and uh, on these three points, namely uh, no longer wanting to join NATO and accept uh, the status of a neutral country, recognizing Crimea as part of Russia and recognizing the uh, separatist republics in Eastern Ukraine, uh, on these three points, uh, or the decision to move on these three points, if it's really true and if it's supported by uh, the majority of the Ukrainian political elite, could offer not what I'd call a negotiated solution, but a partial political capitulation of the Ukrainian side, accepting Russian demands, not all of them, namely the demilitarization of uh, Ukraine, but the most important ones of them. Uh, and it remains to be seen what the meeting between the foreign ministers, Kuleba and Lavrov in Turkey will bring uh, on this front, whether the Ukraine will, uh, will uh, offer a, a consolidated position on these three points uh, and uh, if uh, the Russians are willing to talk about it. But again, I would not say this is a negotiated solution out of the conflict, but I'd say it's more of a political capitulation of the Zelensky government. As we're talking of news fresh off the press, so to speak, uh, you will have seen writers just tweeted, tweeted, sorry, tweeted, writers just tweeted that uh, Biden will be announcing um, an oil ban, um, Russian oil ban, something that, that was asked for um, but he was not willing to deliver on, seems to be coming true. Uh, according to my research, four or five Americans, regardless of political affiliation, are backing um, the administration at the moment on their course vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, considering that apparently Russia is also about to default on its um, financial responsibilities due to the effect of the sanctions. What would you say uh, uh, these sanctions are really doing? They seem to be effective, uh, but can they be effective in weakening uh, Putin to the point that he has in these negotiations? not to give in, but to save face and end the conflict in a timely fashion. Well, revenue from oil exports is much more important than revenues uh, of Russian ga gas exports. Uh, oil is much more relevant for the state budget, but oil exports to the United States, which have increased over the past years, at the same time while the United States was warning Europe of becoming too dependent on Russian energy, make up only about 5% of uh, the Russian export of uh, oil and oil products. Uh, they mean only about 3% of US oil consumption. So the volume that is now being banned from US markets uh, is, is quite small. Uh, so the impact on Russia is limited. And Biden is taking a huge risk, namely rising gasoline prices, which have uh, been on the rise for, for the past weeks. Uh, 
already and analysts are expecting that the gallon will cost more than five dollars uh, in a couple of days, which would be enormous for U.S. standards. And um, this will, of course, increase uh, inflation in the United States, which is already high, has been already high for the past months. And uh, I'm not sure whether um, this majority uh, of U.S. citizens that is now backing going tough on Russia uh, will be sustained uh, if uh, the implications for themselves, for their households becomes uh, as tough as it is looking like at the moment. So Biden is taking a political risk, particularly before the midterm elections in the fall of this year, uh, which his Democratic Party is most likely to lose. Um, but obviously Biden seems to have taken the decision, yes, um, being tough on Russia now is more important than political calculations on the domestic front. May I tag on that, Chris? Um, so let's stay out in the world a little bit before we come back into, into the Euro European realm. One of the news that I can't say it amused me, but, it, but I, found it, I found it particularly poignant in the situation was that Biden has increasingly open channels to the Emirates and to Saudi Arabia, uh, where we know that the Crown Prince and certainly the Democratic administration are not very friendly due to the uh, journalist dismemberment um, um, fairly recently. And, and both Emirates, um, uh, uh, Southern Arabia, and also Venezuela, to mm -hmm. whom extended the hand, have been less than um, receptive, I would say. Now, the question is, what is happening on those other playing fields with this, especially the Middle East, certainly, South America, leave out. But with the Middle East, what do you expect the Russian role to be in the Middle East from here on forth? Has it strengthened its position, also considering its role in the Syrian ongoing conflict? Well, reactions in the Arab uh, region have been rather muted on Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we need to recall that the United Arab Emirates, which are currently a non-permanent member of the Security Council, abstained during uh, the vote on a resolution um, on uh, Russia's aggression uh, about a week ago. Um, that was a clearly a demonstration that um, Russia has consolidated its position in the, in, the, in the Middle East over the past years, despite the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates had uh, different interests in Syria than the Russians have had. But Russia managed uh, to have uh, constructive relations with almost every country in the region. So I don't think that from the Arab region, there will be much of uh, a, a tough position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Of course, if Saudi Arabia is going to increase its oil production, thereby undermining or even ending the cooperation uh, with Russia within the framework of what is called OPEC plus, uh, and with other Gulf uh, countries increasing their oil production, uh, this will have a negative effect uh, on the Russian side in so far as there is more oil available on international markets, which would allow uh, to cut uh, uh, Russian uh, or imports of, of Russian oil. So this would be detrimental to Russian interests. It would also be negative for Russia if, say, an agreement uh, could be found on the uh, nuclear agreement with, uh, with Iran, the JCPOA, um, because if... Uh, Iran returns to uh, this agreement and the United States as well, a lot of sanctions will be lifted, which will mean that uh, Iran can raise its oil production and uh, its oil exports, which would mean additional uh, oil for the international markets. So yes, in the Middle East, we could possibly see moves that uh, are hurting Russian interests. But on the political level, I don't see that there is a lot of uh, distancing from Arab uh, countries uh, from, from the Russians. So as China is testing cryptocurrencies, as the Russians or many of the oligarchs are relying to an extent, and even normal people are relying to an extent on cryptocurrencies, do you see that there is a danger, as the Chinese are putting it right now, and also the Russians, for the dollar in the long run, because what is happening now 
really rules are being rewritten in international trade, first through COVID and now again through this conflict. Uh, is, is there a danger of, of the world markets being destabilized or having to rearrange themselves in the long run? I'd say in the very, very long run, this could be possible, uh, not immediately and not in a short term perspective. But of course, uh, Russia has had an interest in de-dollarizing its economy over the past years to make it less vulnerable to Western sanctions. The amount of dollars in the uh, hard currency basket of Russia's central bank has been decreased significantly. Russia is uh, trading with China and some other countries, uh, not in dollar, but in Russian ruble or in Chinese renminbi. So yes, there is an interest, uh, both of Russia and China and some other countries to weaken the role of the uh, US dollar in international uh, trade and uh, in international finance. However, the, the position of the dollar is still so robust uh, and it's still considered to be so reliable a currency that I don't see and not even midterm uh, threats to this dominance of the United States currency. Uh, coming back to Ukraine and what's going on on the ground there. Um, also, uh, the old question, can we assume that the war didn't go as planned as Russia planned it? Or is the West again too optimistic on what's going on? What's, what are your informations about what's going on on the ground? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say we need to be very careful about such reports. We are in the midst of an information war. So it's in the interest of the Ukrainian and Western side to describe the Russian operation as having failed, uh, of not having achieved the intended results. Um, that is uh, creating a narrative uh, that uh, the US, the West and Ukraine is interested in. And the narrative on the Russian side is, uh, of course, the very opposite. So there is this fog of war, as Robert McNamara has uh, called it when talking about the US war against Vietnam in the 1960s. So we need to be very careful. Uh, however, it seems that uh, according to the initial operations of Russia's military, uh, the Russian general staff uh, quite obviously has expected uh, a considerable faster success for the Russian side than it actually was able to achieve. So we can with uh, great certainty say that the Russian operation has been not as, as uh, success, successful and quick and fast as it had been expected on the Russian side. But we also need to stress that at the beginning of the war, uh, Russia only used about one third of the troops that were amassed on the borders of Ukraine and did not use uh, some weaponry that uh, would have been available for the Russian side. Obviously thinking that uh, such, a, um, such an assault on a, on a limited basis would suffice to, to achieve the results in Ukraine. But now um, all the troops are involved, uh, uh, almost all weapons are in use. Uh, so um, I think that the Russian military operation is not about to, to, uh, to crash, uh, about to fail. Uh, it will be, uh, in the end, at least that's the in, in, uh, interpretation of most Western military experts, be successful in the sense that the Ukrainian armed forces will no longer be able to have broad scale resistance capacity. Um, but um, yes, I'd say they have expected to do that quicker than it actually uh, they were able to do. But we should not uh, believe all reports that say Russia, Russia's actions in Ukraine, its military operations are blocked or stalled or something like that. That's part of this fog of war, this information war. Yeah, that's excellent uh, uh, our point. Mülha Walze, the frog of war. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, I have a twofold question. One is a personal question to you. Um, you have been handed around um, a lot recently as an expert on this situation internationally from, I hear from Japan to of course all over Europe and, and um, in other regions. Um, what is your uh, way of dealing with media information 
also considering now that you have become the basis for media information also here for us. So basically, how do you come to your uh, conclusions in some total? And the second uh, question related to that, uh, how, how, how do you see the media's behavior um, recently? There have been people writing, yes, it's always the same. It's a media frenzy, it's a war. The media helps whipping um, and this conflict further. It fans the flames. Other people are saying it's been rather responsible. How do you see that? And how do you see maybe also the relationship between the classical media? Because it's the first really war that is playing out also in the alternative media in the way we belong to that right now. Um, how do you see alternative versus classical media and what is your role as an expert of experts and how do experts like you arrive at their conclusions? That's sorry, hope it's not too complicated. Well, I for one am trying to be as sober as possible uh, as uh, um, well, objective as possible, not to take sides. I don't want to be an activist. I do have my personal opinions about this war, about the cruelty and the senselessness of this war, but it must not influence my analysis. So I try to keep distance to the events, uh, also emotional distance to what is happening in Ukraine at, uh, at the moment. I do have, of course, uh, multiple sources to get information. I have been dealing with Russia now for 36 years, so for quite a long time, I do have a network of contacts uh, where I get information from, uh, which allows me to, uh, to explain the whole picture and uh, do an analysis. But I also have to admit, I've been wrong uh, several times on, on, on the issue. So even with the best information available to me, it's sometimes not possible to really predict what will, is, what will happen. But at the end of the day, analysts, scientists are not there to predict uh, what will happen, but to analyze what is happening and uh, develop scenarios for, of what might be next. So um, taking into account that uh, there is a certain space for being wrong on the issue, I also need to be careful in my media contacts, which have been have seen a hype over the past weeks, because uh, I must not spread false information, of course, uh, or I should do all the best uh, as much as I can to don't make statements that uh, might turn out to be wrong, because this influences the media debate, this influences the discourse. So uh, scientists need to be very careful. I, for one, I'm not very happy about colleagues who are taking now an activist position. I understand that why they are doing so, but this is not my understanding what analysts should do, uh, taking sides now, despite all the horrific uh, developments uh, we see, the pictures we see, but we need to keep our distance and remain sober. Well, the classical media, of course, um, profit from uh, such an event like a war. Uh, I think that for many, the classical media are seen as more reliable uh, as uh, social media and alternative media, which does not mean that a lot of people are consuming alternative media to get information. But I'd say in terms of credibility, the status of traditional media is higher than that of social media. Within Russia, <laughs> within Russia, according because I know that you have such you have such close contacts, um, uh, and I think a, a, a student or you know people that you have also trained in Russia, in Russia, yeah. Russia right now. What is actually really going on in Russia? Is there any? chance for people to get to what we would call objective news or indeed the the other side of the narrative because the lockdown from what i hear on on the media has been pretty severe uh, and the restriction of civil liberties uh, in russia recently has been also increasingly severe what is your information on that what do the russians know what can they know um, if they want to well, in, it depends on, uh, on several uh, indicators. The older the people are in Russia, the less educated they are, they are uh, almost uh, only consuming state electronic media. Uh, so they get the narrative that is produced by the Russian leadership, which uh, 
which of course characterizes this so-called special military, military operation as a defensive move because of the threat emanating from Ukraine, not just to the ethnic Russians in Ukraine, but to Russia as a country. Um, the younger the people are, the more educated they are, the more well off people are, uh, the more they consume alternative media. But we have to take into account that um, the Russian leadership has demonstrated that it is going after uh, the remaining uh, opposition media left. We have seen the closure of the uh, television station Dorscht. We have seen the closure of the radio station Eka Moskvi. Um, we have seen this new law passed by the State Duma unanimously, by the way, that, uh, that um, well, now foresees uh, prison terms up to 15 years for people spreading false information about the war, for people calling the war a war, calling the invasion an invasion, uh, talking about uh, uh, in a negative way about the Russian armed forces. So the government is doing all it can to suppress, uh, to suppress uh, information exchange via alternative media. And Facebook has been closed down and Twitter has been closed down uh, in Russia. So it's getting increasingly difficult for, for Russians to get information uh, from another angle about, about this war. But there are still there are still options to get it. And there uh, is a certain segment of Russia's population that is using these uh, info channels to get different views on the situation than they get uh, from state media and, and the government. Uh, many are now using virtual private networks to circumvent the blocking of Facebook and, uh, and, and Twitter to keep on getting this information from other independent sources. Uh, as we have seen many Ukrainians fleeing the country, have you heard of any Russian refugees fleeing Russia to the West? Is it still possible by any way so, because you can't fly anymore into the, into the European Union? So have you heard anything about... Well, there are reports about uh, emigration from Russia because of uh, political um, discontent. Russia, yeah. But also because of uh, the fact that many now see no positive uh, economic future for them in Russia, which is now seriously uh, threatened by the costs of uh, Western sanctions. There are reports saying in the past weeks we have seen up to 200,000 Russians fleeing the Russian Federation. But then again, it's an information war that's going on. So I. I have no idea about how anyone uh, is getting credible information about um, the numbers of people leaving Russia. But I do know from context that I have that people are moving out uh, for the two reasons I've said, fearing repression uh, and uh, while seeing no economic future for them, no, no economic benefit for them in a sanctioned Russia. So there will be uh, quite many of them leaving and this will continue but I can't say how many uh, um, have already left Russia are, or are planning to leave Russia in the immediate future. I have just anecdotal evidence, not, not any, any survey or any credible data from anyone about, about the stream of, uh, well, political and economic refugees from Russia. Um, I, would, I would like to continue on from that with a contextual question, uh, maybe a little bit beyond this conflict also, because we do hope it will end and we'll hope it will end soon. And um, The role of the orthodoxy has been very interesting to me because um, for those who remember, and you will, there has been kind, there was this kind of schism between the Ukrainian and the Russian orthodoxy before the Crimea crisis. And I was feeling, oh, there's something in the bushes here. What is this? I mean, the orthodoxy is generally known to be related also to the nationality quite strongly, like the Serbian orthodoxy, the Ukraine uh, orthodoxy, or without the article, Ukraine's orthodoxy, Russian orthodoxy. Uh, Putin has relied heavily from the beginning uh, on the orthodox church in Russia. Uh, and it has been a very strong supporter of his cause. My question to you is, 
Um, where do you feel Russia is going as a society? Because it doesn't seem to be the intellectually sensitive Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, and and you know the the, the Russia that that I think we all here uh, love and and credit with a major contribution to world um, culture. But it's going in in a weird nationalistic spiritual he, he said also we consider the ukraine to be also a spiritual homeland what is going on there uh, and 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 uh, what does that spell for the future even beyond putin is that a real thing that is deeply rooted or was that putin employing very intelligently um those um images to garner the, the support of the normal simple population I, I, yeah. <laughs> Well, what we have seen in statements from the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church supporting Putin's actions in Ukraine. So what we see is another demonstration of this close cooperation between the state and uh, the Orthodox Church, uh, which, is, uh, which benefits both sides. Uh, the influence of the Orthodoxy has uh, been uh, increasing over the past decade or so. Uh, also, the material benefits for the Russian Orthodox Church uh, uh, have been very, very high based on this close cooperation with the Russian state and the conservative, the culture, the conservative cultural agenda of the Russian Orthodox Church actually has been supported by, by the Russian state. So uh, issues like family values, uh, non-traditional sexual behavior, uh, violence against uh, women uh, in, in uh, Russia and uh, uh, the idea by the Russian Orthodox Church that uh, the uh, human rights declared in 1947 ha have not to be applied strictly uh, to a society with, uh, like Russia because traditional moral beliefs and values should be more, more important than these uh, rules written down in the Declaration on Human Rights from, from that year. So this conservative cultural agenda of the Russian Orthodox Church has been supported by the Putin leadership, uh, particularly after his return to the presidency in 2012. At the same time, this close cooperation between the state and the church, which was traditionally called in Russian history a sinfonia between uh, the two, um, is undermining the credibility of the Russian Orthodox Church in certain segments of the population. So it's also quite a risky uh, behavior and strategy of the Orthodox Church, lead Orthodox Church's leadership to have this close uh, cooperation with, with the state. Um, well, in the sense that it, uh, it, is, it is losing credibility, it's no longer trusted by uh, growing segments of the Russian population. The state, of course, benefits from the support of the Russian Orthodox Church because uh, this provides sort of an ideology of a uniting, unifying ideology uh, for the Russian society, at least for many of the people in Russia. So I see it as a win-win coalition between the two. Many people from many countries are now joining the international brigades, which are already, some of them are already fighting in Ukraine, if I uh, have the right information also from them from uh, NATO members. So is there any risk that through this, these people who will, some of them eventually will die, of course, if they fight in the war, that uh, NATO will be involved into the, into the war over this direction or is there no risk? Well, volunteers or maybe even mercenaries now fighting on the side of, of Ukraine against the Russian in, the invasion um, do not mean that NATO countries, even if these volunteers and mercenaries are coming from NATO countries, is directly involved in the conflict. So uh, in this regard, this doesn't mean that NATO gets into a direct military confrontation with Russia. This would, of course, be very different if uh, the Ukrainian demand for a no-fly zone over Ukraine would be accepted by, by NATO, uh, meaning that NATO... Uh, um, airplanes, uh, fighter jets are helping the Ukrainians to defend themselves against the Russian Air Force. Uh, and uh, um, this would definitely mean that NATO uh, Air Force would be or needed to be uh, 
open to the idea of shooting down Russian aircraft. And that, of course, would, would start a direct military conflict between NATO and Russia, uh, which could escalate uh, in a nuclear uh, regard. So a no-fly zone, despite being supported by some NATO countries, is not something that we can expect or we have to expect from, from NATO. Uh, also in, in the next uh, steps of uh, this escalating conflict, because NATO doesn't want to fight Russia and uh, Russia doesn't want to fight NATO. What is a bit risky is this idea of providing aircraft, uh, particularly Polish aircraft to the Ukrainians to, uh, to, to actually hand these aircraft over, uh, sell it uh, to the Ukrainian side for a symbolic prize like the MiG-29 that Poland's Air Force is operating. Um, um, it's, it's risky because for the Russian side, uh, it, it will not be uh, recognizable if these Polish aircraft repainted in Ukrainian colors and handed over as a property to, to Ukrainian armed forces will have uh, Polish pilots or NATO pilots on board or Ukrainian pilots. So there's a gray zone that is now emerging, uh, which uh, the Russian defense ministry three days ago has uh, called uh, as potentially, uh, in, uh, as potentially uh, uh, having NATO states being involved in this armed conflict from a Russian perspective and that bears some potential for escalation. I don't think it's a good idea because we are now moving into this gray zone and we cannot really calculate uh, what escalatory potential okay. this has. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to add that, of course, the Americans have said Poland did not communicate with them. They wanted to exchange in Rammstein, which is an American-run uh, German basis. So the Americans have flat out refused to do that deal. Uh, and, and just to add on to that, several military experts came out this morning, apparently saying it's completely useless anyway, mm -hmm. because they are dogfight, play, expect, meaning uh, that they engage into air battles with nobody because right now the, the Russian Air Force is not really involved. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Mm -hmm. No, I fully agree with that. Um, if, yeah, please, sorry, you wanted to continue. I have just one more question to Germany, but let's stay with Ukraine if you have one follow-up question. I have, let me maybe ask my question last, do yours first, because I have one question. Okay. That's a little bit more than, than Germany. Well, about, uh, it's actually not only about Germany, but now, of course, if there's war, there is, we will see uh, military budgets going up all around the, all around the globe. Um, Germany uh, has said that apart from its 2% uh, GDP target for the defense budget, we, which they already wanted to reach in the coming years, they will spend 100 billion dollars, uh, 100 billion euros more into its military in the coming years. Now, up until now, the world has been very anxious about Germany building up its military for, for obvious reasons, historically. Uh, now, it seems that no one really has a problem with that anymore. How, how did this happen? Well, I'd say that Germany uh, has been criticized very much for not spending enough on defense, particularly criticized by the US, but also the UK and uh, France as NATO allies. They want to have a stronger fighting capacity of the German Bundeswehr, and they have been very critical about the fact that the previous German governments and uh, till the start of this war, also the current German government have, uh, have been reluctant to increase defense spending up to the 2% of GDP that NATO has uh, agreed upon in 2014, uh, and which would, have need, uh, which would have to be implemented till 2024, according to the agreement from 2014. Now it's different. Now, uh, even a social democratic led government is willing to, well, to turn around, to do precisely what allies have been expecting from them to invest in the German military. And according to opinion polls, we see that the majority of the German population is supporting uh, this step, which is a real, actually, uh, a complete change of, of uh, the, Germans, the German government's 
position. Um, however, uh, even if you invest a lot in, uh, in, in your armed forces, it always takes time. It will take years, of course, to increase the fighting capacity of the German Bundeswehr. You cannot simply say by providing 100 billion euros, you will have a more uh, capable armed forces uh, in, in Germany, well, at the start of next year, so to speak, but it will take time, but the decision has been taken and it's supported by almost every party in, in, in Germany, except for the uh, AfD and the Linke. Uh, but there is a consensus between the current government parties and the CDU, CSU about uh, this step. So this is, uh, to a certain extent, surprising. And according to the information I have from my Russian contacts, the Russian side did not expect Germany uh, to, uh, well, actually to, uh, to, do, to take these steps, not just uh, to uh, rearm its armed forces, but also accepting sanctions like the expulsion of uh, Russian banks from SWIFT and even the sanctions on Russian Central Bank. They are quite surprised that Germany uh, did not uh, raise its opposition to such radical steps. So actually they have miscalculated uh, what the German government is willing to do. Um, I would like to conclude from my side with a question that's been uh, on my mind a lot, especially since the Austrian chancellor uh, quite carelessly has trampled upon Austria's um, neutrality status, in my humble opinion, which was granted by the Russians uh, finally in 55. Um, could there now be a way out of this that allows Putin to achieve most of what he wanted to achieve, save face, but also save the Ukrainian nation by, as we all favor, and we've talked about this before, uh, going towards a neutrality standard? Um, could you imagine the now majority, majoritively Russian populated parts of the Ukraine to secede, to become their own kind of little nations that in themselves are neutral and that the Ukraine would agree to neutrality and possibly as a deal get the possibility for a European Union membership? Because I've, I've, I've kind of, because that is per se not military, it would help maybe to keep it non-military, which is in the interest of Putin. Uh, they'd have economic advantages. So it's not, it's not a win-win situation, but it's a, it, for me, it would appear to be a possibility. Do you think that some construction like that uh, is possible? Uh, certainly now from the Ukrainian side, uh, because could they, do you think they could uh, agree to neutrality? Well, after Putin has started this invasion, it was clear that he has to, to gain something by this invasion and uh, to have more than before the beginning of the war in terms of Ukrainian concessions. So uh, from Russia's point of view, this war can only be ended if Ukraine is making the concessions or most of the concessions that the Russians are demanding. And that, of course, certainly means a neutral status uh, for Ukraine. And uh, that also means that Ukraine accepts to lose territory, uh, the Crimean Peninsula and uh, separatist republics in the Donbass. Uh, there will also be a population uh, exchange, of course, because uh, there are, of course, U Ukrainian citizens in, in the Donbass who want to stay with Ukraine not become the citizen of an independent Donetsk Republic or a, a Republic of Lugansk. Um, so this would involve some very difficult uh, decisions, but I don't see any way out for Ukraine uh, uh, if they do not accept these conditions. This would not be a negotiated end to this war. But this will uh, be a Ukrainian decision to accept the status of a somewhat limited sovereignty for their country. Uh, and um, the Russians are not giving in if they don't get what uh, we just talked about. If Zelensky is willing to do that, we will see in the next days and weeks, if Zelensky is able to convince a, a majority coalition in Ukraine's political elite, to back such uh, um, sort of a political capitulation, we will also see because Zelensky, of course, has to take uh, into account how other politicians in Ukraine uh, from the opposition 
but also people within his own party um, uh, will react to this sort of uh, Ukrainian submission. So there are limits to what Zelensky, even if he's willing to do, uh, there are limits to what uh, he can do. But um, summarizing, I don't see an end to this war without Ukraine making these concessions. There's no way back for Putin. He has to go after his uh, geopolitical goals. He has to reach them. Otherwise, uh, this, would, uh, this would be a disaster for Russian foreign and security policy. Totally agree. Could you see a scenario where he cushions the fall of Ukraine by allowing it, as it said, NATO no, but by allowing it to get closer to the European Union and by doing so also up to a point, make amends with the European Union because otherwise there is a new Iron Curtain and otherwise we are living in a new Cold War. If there's no communicate or if there's no giving by Putin, do, do you see that is in his character a little bit? <laughs> Well, uh, there's a difference of opinion in the expert community. Uh, some say th this Russian war is about Russian security. Um, the current leadership feels threatened by the prospect of Ukrainian NATO membership or uh, also Ukrainian NATO military cooperation. If that's the case, then of course, uh, Ukraine becoming neutral uh, would be sufficient for the Russian leadership. But on the other hand, there are other experts, including Russians, who say, no, this is not only, and maybe not primarily about security, but this is uh, uh, due to the Kremlin's, Putin's desire to restore something like a historical Russia, uh, bringing together the, the free uh, Russian people, the Russians, the Belarusians, and, and the Ukrainians. If that's the case, then uh, um, it would not suffice for Ukraine to stay outside of NATO. Um, we we'll have simply to wait and see how, how the Russian position is going to uh, evolve. But um, if the European Union now agrees on, uh, on giving uh, Ukraine a uh, membership perspective, even giving it the status of a country acceding to the European Union, uh, such would not be um, a major uh, reason for conflict uh, between Russia and, and the West, because Russia, of course, understands that even if the, the European Union makes this decision now to open it up for Ukrainian membership, this will take many, many years to materialize because uh, Ukraine is uh, by far not prepared now, economically, financially, politically, legally, to join the European Union. But this is a prospect of at least 10, if not more years. So. Uh, for the Russians, it's not an imminent threat now. So uh, yes, in this regard, uh, uh, a neutral Ukraine uh, on the path to EU membership is, is uh, if the first, uh, if, the, if the one camp of the expert community is right, that it's about Russian security, that the Russians could accept. All eyes on the Bosporus, no? Let's all put pray. Good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you too for today and we will be back soon.